Yes. Let me start. Seems way out of tune. Stand against the power of our God. 
You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God, the almighty fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Sure. Welcome to this beautiful Sunday morning. We are all so happy to have you here with us in person and online. Um, we welcome you and we hope that you just raise your hearts to God this morning, open your minds and hearts, and join us this morning in worship. Technical difficulties. Come, all you weary, come, all you thirsty.
Bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Please join me now in the call to worship. Jesus stands among us saying, peace be with you. Blessed is Christ our Lord and our God. Jesus stands among us saying, receive the Holy Spirit. Blessed is Christ our Lord and God. He is risen. Yes, he is. Please be seated. Oh, what a joy to gather here in the Easter season. Uh, my two-year-old this week asked me when we would get to celebrate Easter again. Uh, and it was my privilege to tell him that we celebrate it uh, every Sunday. And indeed, we're now in this season of Easter where we continue to celebrate it and make sense of it. And uh, uh, Kennedy might say this too, and I told my son that, that he said, it's okay, I still have candy left. Uh, so we, we praise God for gathering us today. If you're visiting with us today, a very special welcome to you. Glad you're here joining us online. Thank you uh, for being a part of us wherever you are. And I know we got people all over uh, coming together to worship with us uh, today. I praise God for that. I want to uh, also... Uh, Give thanks uh, for Isaac, who's preaching today. Uh, Isaac is coming soon to a close of his time with us. His last day with us is going to be May 2nd. And uh, in short order, he's going to be headed with his family for a multi-year uh, mission work in Central Asia. And uh, today may be the last sermon we hear from you before we hear from you uh, later in the future. But uh, we are uh, happy to gather today for worship. I want to invite the kids down, and uh, Pastor Isaac has a message to share with 
with you all before we uh, do the blessings and, and head to Sunday school. Yeah. Come on down. Come on down. Okay. Adam, you can play along. Sure. You know, we've been doing a lot of games when I do my, my children's time. So today it's called a game, called, it's called Follow the Leader. So I'm going to start. I'm going to be the leader. Whatever I do, you have to do. Got it? Got it. Okay. Getting our exercise for church. Okay, I'm done. That's enough exercise for me. Was that fun? Yeah. Now, how about this? What if one of you be the leader this time? You want to be the leader? Okay, so you be the leader. You want to come up here? Yeah, you can come up. And we will be your followers. So whatever you do, we'll do. Okay? Anything else you want us to do? How about one more thing? Is that it? Okay, good job. You want a shot at this? No? Adam, you want to lead us in doing something? Okay, here we go. Follow, follow Pastor Adam. Follow Pastor Adam. Okay, so fun game that we can play, and there's lots of variations of that. Now I have a question, was it more fun? Since you got to be the leader, did you like being the leader? Yeah? Why did you like being the leader? Was it because everyone was following you and did everything you wanted? Now I have a question, what if we were trying to play this game and we were all the leader? Would this game work? Let's try it. Let's all be a leader and do whatever we want. Everyone else to, on the counts, be ready, go. Yeah, it, it just doesn't work, right? If we're gonna play follow the leader and if you want people to follow you, you need followers. You need followers. And sometimes we love being the leader, but it's no use being a leader unless someone's gonna follow you. And that's in playing games. And later, um, you'll learn that in, in, in life as well. And most importantly, in following Jesus. A lot of times we want to lead Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, come with me. Do this for me. Follow along. Where, where Jesus actually says, no, you, come follow me. I have some cool things for you. And so here at church, we actually are learning not to be leaders, but we're learning to be followers. And in just a second, you're going to follow your teachers and go over to class. Okay. So I want you to remember that. Leading is fun, but following is something we all have to learn to do as well. You think we can do that today? Yeah, okay. Good job. I think Pastor Adam's going to lead us. We're going to have a blessing. You guys want to stand up? And we offer you a blessing. And also with you. All right. And Miss Jean's going to be following today. Yeah. <laughs>
Please join me now for the prayer of confession. Let us pray together. O Christ, you rose from the depths of suffering, from death itself, to breathe peace upon your disciples. Still, O Lord, we cannot trust your promise of peace. Still, O Lord, we do not follow in the way of your love. Forgive us when we fail to be people of resurrect. Forgive us when we fail to recognize your grace. Show us your hands and your feet once more and teach us to be your body in the world. Amen. And now hear these words of assurance for us. Those who love me, I will deliver, says the Lord. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. This morning's scripture is Joshua chapter 1, 6 through 9. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it both day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous 
and successful. I Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Our second scripture is Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So my sermon title this morning is Follow. Now, um, how many of you out there are good followers? No, we actually live in a culture now where uh, there are folks out there who are just trying to attain and, and collect as many followers as they can on YouTube or on Twitter or on Twitch or on TikTok. These are all built. And the more followers you have, the more influence uh, you have. Uh, now, if you um, think about that, uh, there's not a whole lot written about how to be a good follower, though. And so uh, I actually did an Amazon search. And first, I put in leadership. How many results do you think I came up with? Came up with over 60,000 results for leadership in the book section of Amazon. And so I typed in the bar in the book section, how to be a follower. How many results came up? 134. And as I scroll down to them, about every other one was actually like titles like how to obtain a following, how to um, grow your, your list of followers that, that were lumped in there. And the other half or every other one was actually all Christian books, how to follow God, how to follow Jesus. And so actually when it comes to the market on how to be a follower, um, Christians have that small, small, small market covered. I actually typed in Christian leadership under books. How many results do you think came up on that side? How about over 30,000? I didn't scroll through all 30,000 of those, though. So even in, in our world, though, Christian leadership, 30,000 books. How to follow? 134. So with that in mind, I thought about, well, what are we good followers of? And I'll jump to following Jesus in just a second, but I just thought in our life, what are some of the things that, that we're actually a good follower of? And some of you all know this already, and I'm, I'm going to proudly say it again. I am a good follower of the Los Angeles Dodgers, or should I say the world champion Los Angeles Dodgers. I'm not going to get sick of hearing that all year long. You know, I'm wearing my tie here. Uh, if, if you were to um, check out my data usage on my phone, especially now, Almost all of it is going to be to streaming my Los Angeles Dodger games for the next eight months, regular season and postseason, because we're, we're the Dodgers, not the Tigers. Sorry, Tiger fans. Sorry, Bob. Um, but you know, if you were to ask me about the Dodgers, I could tell you who the last cuts were. You know, you know the guys who just were left off the team and the guys who just made it on the team, along with, of course, all the stars, uh, all our returning heroes from last year. Uh, I could probably tell you personal interest stories of almost every single one because I've heard them, you, you know, about where they grew up, what their parents were like, their, their biggest accomplishments. Uh, not only that, I could probably tell you a lot about um, each of the seven world championship teams that we've had, the years they've had, the major players in the games, the accomplishments they had, and probably personal interest stories of them as well. You know, I'm such a good follower, I could even tell you stories of people that aren't on the team. Uh, say of our legendary play-by-play -play announcer, Vin Scully, have lots of stories about him. Or even Roger, the peanut man, who, who slung peanuts at Dodger Stadium for over 60 years of his life. Yeah, I can tell you all these stories about the Dodgers. I can even tell you now their record, 7-2. and two. I can tell you probably who's won the game. I can tell you that more than, uh, or six, seven players on our team are batting over 300. All these things, I can tell you. Why? Because... I like my Dodgers, and I follow them. Now, w would you say I'm a pretty good follower of my boys in blue, the world champion Los Angeles Dodgers? Yes? 
Yeah, okay. I, I, I hope you, you would think so. Now, I'm wondering, there has to probably be at least one thing in your life that you also are a good follower, maybe even a great follower of. So perhaps some of you out there are Harry Potter fans. You've read all the books, seen all the movies. You can tell us like the parts they left out of the book that you wish were in the movie. Or maybe um, you have gone to or you plan to go to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter down in Florida. Or even better, you plan to go to London and go visit Anna Castle and King's Cross Station, Platform 3 and 9 and 3 quarters being there, of course. Or maybe even Christ Church in Oxford or Gothland Station, which it was what they used for Hogsmeade Station. Yeah, you're just such a big fan that you'd want to go see all these things and you'd know where they are. Okay, I'm getting a lot of blank stares. And so I'm guessing, don't have a lot of Harry Potter fans in here. How about Lord of the Rings? Tolkien, The Hobbit, maybe. And so, yeah, okay, I, I see some nodding heads finally back there. Or maybe if it's not that, maybe it's the Marvel, uh, either the comics or the cinematic universe. Any fans of that out there? Okay. Let's see. Or, or you might have a poet or an author that you've read all their works or you've collected all their poems because they're that important to you. How about this? Are there, are there any Apple followers out there? I'm actually not, but in researching this, if you are, you're probably geeked out about the M1 chip, right? If, you, if you're an Apple follower, you know what I'm talking about. Um, Kevin, if he's watching this, he knows all about the M1 chip. He's like, we have to get the M1 chip on all our computers here at church. And so shout out to Kevin. Or maybe you've heard about the new AirTag trackers that Apple's coming out with, or, or even the iPhone 13. You might be excited about that, and you keep up with all things Apple. Still not seeing a lot of shaking heads here. Yeah, and so, okay. How about this? Cars. We, we're in the Motor City. Are there any cars, car fans in here? Yes? Some of you probably worked at some of the big three companies. You guys know cars. I, I was working on my car, and um, I mostly drove GM cars, and I had to change brakes in, in, a, in a Ford car, and I was just like, I hope it's close, and, and it, I, I didn't nick myself up too much, and I uh, only needed to watch like two YouTube videos to, to, to figure it all out. But yeah, you guys might know cars, and some of you might have even known the story of Ford versus Ferrari before it became popular this past year. Some of you might even have owned a Shelby Classic or have one ever. Anyone Shelby Classics out there? Okay. Well, maybe online. We're hoping someone out there. If you follow cars, you, you would know that. So, you know, my generation, uh, we're not into newspapers anymore, but some of you might still have a newspaper, which you read every single day or try to. Um, a lot of people in my generation, rather than newspapers, we listen to podcasts. And, and usually we have favorite podcasts that we want. We know when they're going to go live. We know when they're going to drop. And, and if we're really following it, right when it becomes live, we, we want to be the first to listen to them all. Now, I'm sure out there, there's also, um, some of you might be good followers of, of a certain political candidate that, that you were, were behind this past season and continue to support. Uh, and you're really hoping, you, you, you know what they stand for, what they promised, and you're hoping they're going to follow through on all those promises. You know, we, we, we all follow something in our lives. And I'm, I'm thinking all of us have something good or great that we follow. And so I want you just to take a moment right now and think about what is something that I actually know a lot about and I follow a lot. Um, and turn to someone, um, in this case probably someone related to you, or, or, or keep social distancing, uh, and just share with them real quickly. Take about 30 seconds. If you're online with us, uh, drop it in the chat section right now and just uh, tell us what's something that you follow. Okay, and so ready, go. 30 seconds, go. Okay, husbands, wives, did you guys actually learn anything about each other? What were some things? Just shout them out here in this room. I'll repeat them so those online can hear. What are some things that, that people follow out there? Something you heard from someone else? Baseball. Baseball. Golf. Golf. Like you, you know who's going to win the Masters today. Okay, who, what else? Yeah. Mystery books. What was that, Cass? Duck Dynasty. <laughs> Duck Dynasty, of course. And, 
Okay, I'm not hearing all these. And so, so someone who's online, go, go ahead and type those in. Yeah, the, 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 these are all things that we're good followers of. And so, so we all know that, that we all follow things in our lives. Now here's the question. When it comes to following Jesus, how would you rate yourself as a follower of Jesus? Good? Even great? Maybe you're just at the beginning of your journey of following Jesus. Or maybe you have a lot still to be learned in being a follower of Jesus. And I want to say wherever you are, it's okay. But I hope by the time our time here is done, that uh, hopefully you'll be inspired to be even a little bit better, one step further along in being a follower of Jesus. Now, in, in the story that uh, Carol read for us this morning, the, the second one specifically, uh, um, you know, as a kid, I was always inspired by the story, uh, but I was also um, sometimes a little scared by it. You know, so here we have Jesus coming along, calling his disciples, and as kids, of course, we all learn the, the song, I will make you fishers of men. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, it, it's great. We're inspired, and they follow Jesus. But I always wondered as a kid, and e even growing up, so it's, did they really just leave their parents behind? What would mom feel about them leaving? What about their dad who gets abandoned and has to work alone now when Peter and Andrew just leave, and then later John and James join them? And then, of course, you start thinking about Three years is a long time. It's just like, did they smell like fish the rest of their lives for the next three years? Because it said they just left. They didn't take anything with them. And then, of course, it inspires me, and I, I, I start thinking, could I do that? And then I really think about it. I'm like, I don't know if I could do that. Really? We're just supposed to immediately leave and go? That's, I guess, inspiring, but um, it also... I guess it makes me feel like, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I can be like these guys. I don't know if I can immediately just leave and follow Jesus. And so in thinking about that, I've always thought to myself, it's like, I'm not sure I'd be a good follower. I might even be a bad follower of Jesus with all these thoughts I have in my mind. So I've wondered, have you ever had those questions yourself? That really, would I leave immediately if Jesus called me? And if you had, then you'll actually be in, in good company, or actually, should I say, bad company in following Jesus. You know, I always wonder, would we measure up to these first disciples of Jesus who immediately or at once left and followed Jesus? And even with my uh, being inspired and being a little scared about what that might look like, I think we should learn from these disciples. After all, they were employees, one, two, three, and four, of the world's largest and world history's largest organization ever. So if ever we were to learn about how to follow, uh, maybe we should look at these first disciples. And so I, I want to jump to some background of the story. And so we're, we're in present day, uh, or th then it was the Israel, which is actually today even present day Israel and Palestine, uh, where they're located. And at this point, um, it had been 600 years since a foreign power had come and wiped out the kingdoms of Israel and took them in and, and started ruling the land. And then empire after empire after empire ruled over uh, um, Israel and, and the Jewish people who were there. They were a vassal state. And so they paid taxes. And at this point, when Jesus came around, it was the Roman Empire, the biggest and baddest of them all up to that point. Um, it had been 400 years since they'd even had a prophet of God, someone who spoke on God's behalf to give them instruction or give them encouragement or even to kick them in the butt and say, hey, what are you doing wrong? They've had no word from God for over 400 years now. But they hung on to this promise that there would be a Messiah someone who would come back, someone who would restore their kingdom to them, their Davidic kingdom to them. And a Messiah simply meant a, a deliverer or a savior, someone who would restore power to them. And so they had dreams about this, 600 years not having your own land, 400 years without hearing from God. Uh, they were waiting. They were waiting, waiting, waiting 
for this uh, Messiah to come. And of course, they knew it was going to come through the line of David. And so they, they, they were, they were um, looking for this Messiah. Now, some were better than others in their waiting. Some were really anxious. Some were fed up. Some were really hopeful. But any good Jewish person at that time would have been looking through the scriptures, would have been reading the times of, of the day to figure out, is this when the Messiah is going to come? They might have even followed certain leaders who they thought might have been the Messiah, might be the one who's going to restore their kingdom to them. And we know actually um, one of Jesus' first 12 disciples did exactly that. He, he, he followed another leader for a bit, and he, he was given the moniker Simon the Zealot because of an association he had, a follower he had prior in his life. But each of them were waiting for the one to come back, the one who would save them. And so Peter, Andrew, James, John, they had probably done their homework. They were waiting for this Messiah. They'd probably checked out other teachers and rabbis of the time to hear their message, to see whether they were worth following, just like Simon the, the Zealot had done. They had probably, or I know, they had heard of this Jesus person, and maybe they had even heard Jesus speak somewhere or, or do some certain things. And so they were ready when Jesus came and says, hey, come, follow me. They were ready for the invitation. It was actually an honor that this teacher, this rabbi, who they had pretty high hopes on, would invite them to be, again, their first employees, their first followers. Even their parents probably knew that, you know, at some point, our young men are going to have to follow their own path, and we just hope they follow the right leader in that path. In light of this, you know, I wonder, what's our preparation like in following Jesus? How are we preparing ourselves for when Jesus comes and says, follow me? Are we as prepared as the disciples to immediately and at once drop our disciples and turn and follow? What would we have to do to get to that point, just like Peter and Andrew and James and John did at the beginning? You know, I write words of encouragement and challenge, just little sticky things uh, that I place all over the house or I, I have some on my phone or, or in my car. Uh, but there's been one little note that has stuck with me for almost two decades now. Uh, and I was going to take a picture, and I totally forgot to take a picture of it because it, it's in my um, bathroom cabinet. And it's simply one word, follow. And it's been this reminder for me in my life that that's first who I am, following God, following God. Jesus. It's a reminder that each day is both an opportunity and challenge to follow Jesus. You know, if I was honest with you, I could say um, a lot of times I'm probably a better follower of uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers, world champion Los Angeles Dodgers, than I am of Jesus. I spend a lot of energy there and if I'm truly honest, I'm like, do I spend as much energy in figuring out how I can follow Jesus as well? Because following Jesus isn't this one-time prayer that we make as a little kid or maybe as an adult. Following Jesus is more than just coming to church once a week. Following Jesus is more than joining a Bible study or a prayer group. Following Jesus is an everyday, all-day commitment in our lives. And when we choose to follow Jesus each and every day, we, could, we become better at it. Now, as Adam mentioned, and you've heard in my, in my sermons before, um, you know that my family, uh, we're trying to figure out how we're going to follow Jesus. And we're may, waiting for that moment where we can say, okay, drop our nets, let's go. But there's been a lot of things that have had to happen uh, before that's gonna ha that, that we finally depart. And it even starts from the very beginning. Now, when Misty and I um, met, we both had a passion for, for missions in our life and for other cultures. Uh, she's fluent in Spanish, and I'm passable in Korean and 
probably some would say in English as well. Uh, but we both had the, these experiences, me being born um, in a different country and Misty visiting, that, that we would love to, to sometimes serve uh, in a different country. And so, you know, when we first met, it was actually we talked about it on our first date, just where that passion came from, uh, some of our experiences. And, and I've shared before uh, my, my story of how on our first date I, I show, or told her, uh, you, you know, I, I, as a as an adult, I got chased out of a, a, a jungle by, by monkeys in a different culture. And of course, she thought I was telling a childhood story when it had recently happened. And so we both had this passion in our lives. Uh, and even when we started to get serious in a relationship, we, we talked about, you know, when we have kids, we love to pass on some of that passion to our kids, and we'd love for them to experience living in a different country and seeing what following Jesus in a different country might look like. And then, of course, when we got married, we thought, okay, yeah, th th this is going to happen. But there are certain things that we had to get in order before we knew this was going to happen in our lives. So the first thing was uh, we had to clear our debt. We had tons of it from school. And so we, we did FPU together, Financial Peace University. And I know several of you here have done that um, in this church, and it continues to be offered here. And in the first three-plus years of our lives, we actually cleared $100,000 of debt and so we checked that off, our, our list of things that, that we had to do before we could even pr prepare or, or think about the mission field. Uh, we also were thinking, you know what, we, we, we want to raise kids there, but, but maybe we want to start having kids. And me being older in life, it's like, well, let's start now. And so during that time, uh, we, we started having kids as well. And, and you've seen them. We have three under the age of five uh, right now. And so, okay, so, so, so kids are ready. <clears throat> And then we were um, serving at a church, and we wanted to transition well out of this church. And it just so happened that there was this opportunity to kind of slide out as the church was trying to figure some things out. And we thought this great opportunity was there for the taking, and the God was calling us there. Or at least I thought so. Misty knew a little bit better than I did. So we transitioned out of this church just to have this other opportunity uh, just not work out at all. And so there's this, oh, okay, well, God, um, maybe now's not the time. Well, we'll still listen and discern what we're going to do. And uh, it just so happened, um, I was talking to Adam, and Adam was excited about this sabbatical he was going to take, three months, you know, to go learn, refresh himself, uh, learn to be a better leader, actually, I, I think, and actually also how to inspire the church to be better leaders as well. And, and so we prepared for, for that time. Uh, and then we all know what happens. Worldwide pandemic. But at that point, it's just like, oh, well, it's just going to be the next couple of months. And it's just like, you know, Adam said, I'm not going to take my sabbatical, but why don't you stay on? You can help us out till the pandemic's over in the next two or three months. Yeah. As we know, it's been a year later, and I'm still here helping out in whatever way I can. But, but through this all, it's actually given our family, Misty and I and our family, a chance to prepare some more. We started looking at some other sending organizations to figure out, is it a right fit? Uh, and after some interviews and application processes and, and, and just, um, just, just hearing God speak to us through other people and in our own lives, uh, we finally uh, got connected with and our mission partners with the, um, the Antioch Partners, Ascending Group. And so, but then that was all the way back in August. And so it's just like, okay, God, we're ready to go. Let's go. And conversations were just not there. And so they thought, oh, we have this great opportunity. And so, hey, let's get in touch. And it, it, like, it's, it's a no-brainer. It's a good fit. It should all work out. And, and those conversations and emails have just dragged out for months now. And so we're still not sure. We're pretty sure we're going to end up somewhere. We're feeling called to Central Asia, but we're not sure uh, where we're going to end up yet. We're still discerning that when and why. But even as we're discerning that, there's lots of things for us to do. And why are we doing all these things? So when we do hear that call of, hey, follow me to this place that I'm preparing for you, or I've prepared for you, we can say, yes, yes, God, we'll go. So as you can tell, in following Jesus, a lot of preparation takes place before that big moment where we leave our nets behind and follow Jesus. And we're excited 
to hear when Jesus says, come, follow me, I'll make you fish for people. I couldn't imagine we could say yes unless we were preparing ourselves. But you know, at some time and place, and depending on the day, I feel differently about it. It is just a leap of faith, and we just have to go out and do it. Now, being here in Michigan, I, I, um, we live on a small lake, and we just had a winter. Uh, and um, d- d- there's a great spot right outside our window that everyone that lives on the lake, that's where they come to go ice fishing. I can tell you all about ice fishing. Uh, it's just like, fr- from all the safety protocols, of course, of how thick the ice should be, go test it out. I've done that with the kids. You know, I can tell you all about the equipment needed, the, the, um, the brand of the warming tents that they have out there, how they actually heat them. I can tell you all about the, the permits that you need, how much it costs, and they do check on, on our lakes, um, and, and how much it would cost, and even if, if I need them for the kids or if we could share permits, I can tell you all about that. I can tell you which are the best ice fishing reels. And I can even tell you, I've watched the videos of how they work, and it's pretty cool them like setting up their reels and fishing for ice. Now I have a question. Have I actually gone ice fishing? Yeah, I haven't gone ice fishing. I've had all this opportunity to go ice fishing, and usually I just sit on my couch and think, oh, that, that, I should try that sometime. But it's really cold out there. Maybe, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. Maybe next year. I've never taken the leap of faith to go out and actually ice, fish, even though I've had the opportunity year after year. I think at some point, we have to be ready just to take that leap of faith. We have to be ready to trust and obey when Jesus calls us. You know, there's a story of a fellow who got stuck in a belly of a whale. And he's been trying to follow the right path to do the right thing, but he's just stuck there. Luckily, he has a friend along with him who encourages him and shows him what it is to trust and to just let go. I actually have a movie clip of this fellow in the belly of the whale. So let's see if they can get this loaded up here for us. For those of you online with us, uh, this is going to be copyrighted, so I'll come back and give you a quick summary at the end. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll just skip this. I'll, I'll just, you, you guys know where I'm going with this, okay? And so I'll quickly describe it. So here we have Marlon, of course, who's, who's a clownfish. He's trying to find Nemo, yes, his son, who, who, who's, who's been captured. And they're stuck in this belly of the whale. And of course, Dory, at the funny part, she's speaking to the whale. And Marlon says, quit upsetting her. You can't speak whale. And, and there's this part right, right here that, that you're watching. And, and, and something big's about to happen. And... and um, Dory tells Marlon, it's just like, I think he's telling us to go to the back of the mouth. And, of course, Marlon says, no way, I'm not going to be fish or whale food. Uh, And then there's a point they're just hanging on. They're just hanging on. And and the whale says something, and Dory's like, I think he said to let go. And Marlon's just hanging on and and is holding Dory because Dory's already let go. And he's just like, no, 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 we can't let go. He says, how do you know nothing's going to go wrong? And Dory says, I don't. And there's that moment where, where, where he considers, what should I do? What should I do? 
then he lets go. And then the next scene, all you hear is a, a big gurgling sound, and you hear a whoosh, and you hear them flying out of the whale's blowhole and landing in Sydney Harbor to laughter and joy. They just had the ride of their life and landed where they needed to be, where they'd been trying to get from the beginning of the movie. You know, at some point, we just need to let go and trust. <clears throat> and many times that, that ride's fun, but the very next scene when you see Dory and, and, and Marlon again, they look around and see how much work is left. Sydney Harbor is not this small place. And they have to look everywhere to figure out where Nemo is and the boat Nemo was taken on is. That's a little bit of where we feel we're at right now. We're enjoying the ride. But we know that there's just so much unknown and so much work to be left done. Pastor Adam mentioned uh, I'm finishing my time here uh, at the beginning of May. Uh, and that's because some of the work and some of the preparation we have to continue is in raising financial support for our following Jesus, where Jesus is going to call us. And it's not just a, a few calls and a few meetings, but it's in getting in front of literally hundreds of you and asking, hey, is God speaking to you to maybe be a financial partner, to be part of our journey? Can we, do you want to share in that with us. And so we're hoping and praying that many of you might want to partner with us as well. And you'll be hearing about that in my next couple weeks and moving forward, how exactly you can do that. And I would ask that you might pray for us as we enter this next stage of where we are in our journey in following Jesus. And in doing so, my prayer for you is that you might become a better follower of Jesus by preparing for how God might be using you. You know, one of my uh, favorite speakers and authors is this guy named Bob Goff, and um, Adam and I had the privilege of hearing him at a conference once, and I've heard him some other times. I was re-listening to, to one of his talks, uh, and he, he's a um, really funny story, but he, he's a... Uh, uh, let's see, let me get it right. A consul general for the country of Uganda, an honorary lawyer for, for the country of Uganda, and he, it, it's pretty funny. Uh, like, he gets the diplomatic tags. His house actually isn't U.S. soil in his house. He actually is in Uganda for that. But he tells this story of one of his first times in Uganda. They're leaving this village, and, you know, he, he, he starts waving goodbye because there's a couple kids there, and so two or three kids start following and so he's waving, and then more kids follow, and soon there's a dozen. And so he's waving with both hands, and all these kids are starting to follow, and there's two dozen, three dozen, 50 kids starting to chase them out of this village. And he just thought, oh, that's just so cute. Later on, his translator tells, them, tells him that, uh, you know what? Here in Uganda, this actually means follow me. And so the more he was waving, that's what the kids were doing. They're following him. You know, I sometimes think that that miscommunication he had is a miscommunication we have as well. I think God is waving to us and says, follow me. And we sit and say, hi, God, how you doing? And God's up there saying, follow me. And we're saying... Hiya, how, how are you? God is continually saying, follow me. That's his call from the very beginning. And so I wonder what the invitation is for you and how you might prepare yourself to follow. You know, there's lots of opportunities right here at church on how you might follow. Maybe God is calling you to Become a commissioned ruling elder or lay pastor, like our very own Jenny Steeler heard that call a couple years ago, or Charles Sadler, who's part of this congregation, who's becoming a commissioned lay pastor. Maybe you're hearing the calling and the opportunity to serve in worship, 
And there's tons of different ways. And I want to give a shout out to all the people that you've seen in the, in the worship band and all the people in the back. They're here faithfully almost every single Sunday making this all happen. It takes a lot to make the live stream happen, to make the sound happen, to make the worship happen. And I will say, um, they need some rest. They need some help. Maybe you're hearing God say, hey, maybe I can help in some way. And there are different ways that maybe you can be a part of that. Maybe you hear God telling you, you know, how, how can I help teach? Either with the kids or with the adults. Maybe God's saying, how can I, or how can you be hosp hospitable to our guests that come? How can you extend or a ministry of hospitality? Or maybe it's in community organizing. Maybe there's certain justice issues or healing issues that you're just feeling God saying, hey, take this on. Help the church figure out ways that we can be part of the solution, whatever that's for. Or maybe at work you're hearing God saying, hey, you need to find a new job. Or maybe it's a, hey, how can you start treating your job as a way that you can follow me? And maybe that's in how you treat your fellow coworkers or your employees or your boss. Maybe you start a Bible study right there at work. Or you start a prayer group for those at your work. Maybe you have heard the calling or hearing the calling that you want to plant a new church, a new way to worship. Or maybe, maybe you don't want to go that far, but maybe you've been thinking, you know, God wants us to connect to this world in different ways, and I can help Lakeshore do that. How are you hearing God saying, follow me? Even as we prepare to go, I want to share last, a quick story of another young leader who was following Jesus, and his task was a big one. He had to take over Moses' uh, leadership and lead the people into the promised land and it's fitting that the very first thing God tells him before he enters is be strong and courageous and he says it three times and anything anytime we hear something three times um, the importance grows exponentially and three times he hears this go with strength and courage be strong and courageous as you are going to be part of fulfilling God's plans then he says, go with strength and courage. Be strong and very courageous. And follow God's commandments, because when you do that, you're going to be successful and prosperous. And then the third time, go with strength and courage. Be strong and courageous, for I am with you always. These are words that Jesus echoed at the end of the Great Commission. Which begins with what? Go, disciple all the nations. Everyone, everywhere needs to hear about God's love. So friends, go. Go with strength and courage. Go, go ice fishing. Go, go disciple the nations. Go and follow Jesus wherever he calls you. And he is calling, calling you to follow. Hallelujah. Amen.